on more than one occasion, refer to the KISS method of teaching. Keep it simple, stupid. That's critical for two reasons today. Number one, it's a complicated world. Uh, this technology is fantastic. We, we love it, but it does complicate some things. Welcome to the Winners Find a Way Show, Episode 6, The Fundamentals of Leadership and KISS, with Tim Selgo, former collegiate athletic director, best-selling author. When we talk about KISS, we mean keep it simple, stupid. Tim talks about getting back to the fundamentals of leadership, and you will not want to miss Tim speak about the difference between balance and commitment. From his best-selling book, Make One Play, How Little Things Are Important, Work-Life Balance, emotional control, and of course, humility and maturity in leaders. Welcome to the Winners Find a Way show. I got my special guest, Tim Selgo. Say hello, Tim. Hey, Trent. Thanks for having me, man. Great to be here. Man, I'm excited. I'm excited about this. Today, we got a great show for you. Uh, I, I love to start this story because well, I played at the University of Toledo, and so did Tim. Uh, but I met some great people, just some very influential people when I was down at UT. I played both baseball and tennis for the U there. And, man, I, I met Nick Saban, who was our head coach there for one year in football. Ken Manny was a longtime strength coach for uh, the Rockets and the Spartans and the Buckeyes. And he was a big influencer and mentor for me in my life. And uh, Matt Eberflus, uh, you remember Matt, uh, a walk-on football player who is now the defensive coordinator for the Indianapolis Colts. And uh, Mark Wilkins and I played together, uh, played in the major leagues a while. And Kevin Barr's a, a good friend and fellow strength coach in Major League Baseball, also a Toledo Rocket baseball player. And so, man, it just, and the list just keeps going on and on. But also I met Tim Zelgo, right? And Tim Zelgo was the associate AD when I was there. And uh, man, you were helping us along, getting us better. Man, we were we were a little bit, you know, kids that are lost on a big campus, and you'd been through it before. And man, you were you were a little bit of a calm and a storm for me, Tim. So it was awesome, and still a mentor today. And we're we're, we're at 30, 31 years later, I think, man. Yeah, I think that speaks most loudly that I'm a lot older than you, Trent. <laughs> so, well, I like you. I had a great experience at the University of Plato. I can't say enough about uh, our alma mater. Uh, I got both my bachelor's degree, my master's degree there. I had the uh, opportunity to serve as a graduate men's basketball coach, assistant men's basketball coach, head women's basketball coach. Well, and as you mentioned, I was the associate athletics director there for eight years. And along the way, I got, I got to meet some great people like you did and uh, one of the biggest influencers in my life. Yeah, I mean that's that's so awesome, Tim. That's that's cool. I'm glad I'm glad you had a similar experience that I did. So let's talk about what the show's about. Winners find a way. Have you ever faced stiff adversity? Felt like the losses are mounting? You know, you need to find a better way. Well, I think you came to the right place. We talk to a lot of folks who have been down that road. You know, whether you know you're a leader, entrepreneur, a founder, a executive, and you're just trying to get into that 1% category. Like, hey, I want to be the best of the best. We see a lot of athletes. We see a lot of people on the show that have gone down these roads and these journeys. And listen, it's it's not easy to be elite, right, Tim? I mean, and, and what we're going to talk about is that Tim, this is how elite this guy is. I mean, first of all, three, three Hall of Fames, all right? Like, that's no joke. Three Hall of Fame. So, so impressed with that. A long time, uh, you just mentioned your Toledo qualifications, of course, and you didn't mention that you were a pretty darn good basketball player there too, by the way, but long tenured athletic director at Grand Valley State. The Lakers won 18 straight President's Cups. You want to talk about an elite program. We're talking to a man today who's run an organization at the top level. And for those who've never been at the top, and some of us have had brief stints, Right, Tim? You've had longer stints. <laughs> but anybody knows who's been at the top, the first thing everyone tries to do is knock you off it, right? Like, and everybody's coming for you. And I'm sure, as you and our, my, our friend Nick Saban will attest, people would like to knock off the Alabama football team, right? <laughs> like, they've been champions for a while. And so 18 straight, I mean, unbelievable uh, Central Region 80 of the year for, you know, three times. Um, yeah, I, I can't even get to the Hall of Fame in school. So, you know, I'm, I'm so impressed with you got three of them. Still a staffing consultant, now author and speaker, uh, wrote the book, 
Anchor Up, Competitive Greatness, the Grand Valley Way, talking all about that sustainability of championship level and elite. So you better pick that up. And then his newest book, Make One Play, which we're going to talk about today. A little personal, Tim. Uh, hey, wife of 38 years, no joke. And uh, three children, five grandchildren, all boys. <laughs> so it's just testosterone running around the old, you know, Selgo world. As I tell people. Uh, I've spent a lifetime in athletics, and I'll be going to games the next twenty years with these uh, five grandsons of mine. And yes, and, uh, uh, you should. You know, they should. They should get you like the best lawn chair possible, right? Like you should have like a recliner. Does Lazy Boy make a lawn chair? <laughs> I, I do have uh, a chair for the outdoor sports, of course. And then yeah. my daughter got me for uh, Christmas a couple years ago one of those little folding things to put in. The oh, book. oh, they're a lifesaver for those. Oh. Of getting older and i've spent a lifetime sitting in bleachers watching games right that that chair on the aluminum bleacher alone is worth its weight in gold right like i mean gold right i i think i offered a guy one day like 150 dollars for one at a, at a football game one night right so um at any rate tim tell tell people before we get started tell people where they can find you sure they can find me uh first of all on twitter at tim Selgo. Just at T I M S E L G O. So I'm uh, I'm active on Twitter and LinkedIn, of course. I'm uh, on LinkedIn a, a lot. Uh, I'm on uh, Facebook and Instagram as well. Uh, but I also want to give people my blog. Uh, I've done a lot of uh, work over the years on, uh, on my blog, and that can be found at timselgo.tumblr.com. And that's, so that's Tim Selgo, all one word, my name. Dot Tumblr, T U M B L R dot com. And uh, interestingly enough, Trent, as you, you, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about winners finding a way and dealing with adversity, as you talked about. Uh, a year ago at this time, and it must have been a year ago when we all got shut down. Yeah. More adversity have we faced in, in our lifetimes, really, than this pandemic. Yeah. I wrote a, a blog piece, uh, Leadership During a Crisis. So it fits in nicely with uh, everything we're about today because, you know, that's just life on earth. You're facing times and it's not going to go perfect. Um, we'll, uh, we'll get through this at the end of the tunnel here. So we'll get through it, but you got to find a For way. Sure. Got to make it work. That's right. Got to make it work. So tell, tell me, I asked you to come on the show. You're a personal friend. I, I know you'll do something for me, but... Tell people why you do what you do. You help a lot of people. You, you've garnered a ton of knowledge over the years. Tell why you come on a, on a platform like this and talk about how winners find a way. Why do you do it? Well, two, two things. Uh, I feel very blessed in my lifetime. Uh, I had some wonderful mentors, which we'll talk we'll, about them as we go along here, what they taught me and helped me as a leader and helped me find some success in life. Uh, so, you know, finding the right mentors is so important. I spoke to a group of college kids two days ago, and I talked to them about look for mentors that you respect, that are doing things the right way, and they're achieving some success. And man, have I been blessed uh, with tons of them, uh, uh, which we'll talk about. But the, the other reason I do what I do, I, I retired as an athletics director in July of 2016. And for the past four and a half years, I've been a consultant in college athletics, uh, as you've mentioned, I wrote two books. I've got book number three in the works right now, and I do a lot of speaking. And I just feel it's important for me. I've been blessed, and, and the good Lord has given me some wonderful experiences that I should share those experiences and help other people. Uh, if I had a mission statement for my second career here as a consultant, writer, speaker, it would be to help others. And I just want to share my experiences, share my stories that they might help other people out there in their careers or in their personal life. It's that simple. I love it. You and I are very well aligned. I've even got my my entrepreneur organization mentorship hat on today. Actually, I'm I'm sporting the mentor because I am such a proponent of mentorship, as you well know. And I and I tell the same thing to kids like, hey, find somebody who's done it before who's gone before you and done it and knows where the landmines are knows where the pitfalls are right like that's that's a huge value and i would say uh in your experience how many times do you think you've asked somebody of high level status elite one of those one percenters because you know tons of them you've got a great network of these folks right 
How many times do you think you've asked someone for help in that category and uh, they said no? Uh, never. 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 Like these people want to do exactly what you and I do, right? They want to pass on this knowledge of information, especially to someone who's willing to hear it and move forward. That That is the key. You know, I, I think of, I've looked back on my life, Trent, and uh, uh, I, I'm so thankful the good Lord blessed me with uh, the ability to do certain things. But I always said that the one thing that I think God gave me that I would not give up for anything, and it's the love to learn. I love, I'm constantly wanting to learn about things and get, and, you know, not just get better, but just to learn. And it, it goes beyond curiosity. It's to learn to help you help other people. Now, how, what can you learn that can be of help to someone somewhere along the way? And, uh, you know, we'll talk about my book later on, but it's based on the premise of you never know what one thing will lead to. Word of advice or help or encouragement or a smile will lead somebody else's life. I'm thankful God gave me the will and the love to learn and get better. I'm learning how to cook right now. I, retired. <laughs> I told my wife, I'll do the cooking. And here, four and a half years later, eh, I'm not bad. I went from all right, all right, yeah, nice. All right, I'm getting a little bit better, but you know that that to me is is critical because, as you said, I've had great mentors, and they all want to help me in part because I think they knew I wanted to learn, and I was a willing learner, and I was willing to be taught. And that's a huge, huge key. You have to be willing to accept constructive criticism. You have to be willing to be taught. And you have to be willing to learn and have an open mind about it because you never know where you're going to learn from. I love that. I love that. That's great. And I tell you, you know, for leadershipity, right? We do a lot of work there. And I'm telling you, if you're going to be in leadership, you better be a lifelong learner. Like it's going to change. We're going to have to adapt. Like things are changing. As you said a year ago, that article, like you've got to start learning. It's crisis leadership. And it just arrived at your doorstep, right? So like get ready, set, you know, this is, this is ready, go, set, because like you don't even have time, right? This is back to ready, fire, aim in the entrepreneurial world, right? Winners Find a Way show is brought to you by data-driven operations powered by Journeys. Journeys is a software solution that helps you create a winning formula for your organization. DD Ops powered by Journey helps you act as one, see as one, work as one, play as one, win as one. Are you looking for visibility, coachability, and productivity amongst your team? DD Ops is your software. Click on the link in the show notes to learn more. So where I want to start, though, is you know, you pretty high level division one basketball player and, and you're from a very small town. I mean, a very small town. Right. And most people don't even know where, you know, northwest Ohio is right? <laughs> like they think Toledo's northwest. And you're like, oh, no, no, no. There's a lot more of Ohio left. Right. And you are in the northwest Ohio corner there. But when you were that kid, that, that what's the most impactful point that you had as a kid that said, boy, you know, this is, I think I can play basketball at this highest level, and, and I want to make that jump to this next step. Well, the town I grew up in was Pettisville, Ohio, about 400 people. I graduated with a class of 52. But my good fortune was my own father, uh, who obviously was a great mentor to me, was a teacher and a basketball coach at Pettisville, Ohio. And so I had the opportunity to not only be taught by my dad in his class of history and geography, but I also uh, played for him. And uh, I had two older brothers. My older brother, Dick, played at Bowling Green, our, our tribe at Toledo. So did my brother. Yeah. He played baseball there. And so I grew up in an athletics family. And again, I was, a, I was that young kid that ate, slept, and drank basketball, you know, and uh, I couldn't get enough of it. And I was always out. We had a little court in our backyard. I was always out shooting baskets. And uh, so what I... Think back now, Trent, and I can remember tagging along with my dad to basketball practice. My dad was a great coach now. He won over 75% of his games, highly successful. And that was a blessing for me because from that point on, I knew what good teachers looked like. I knew what it meant to be a good teacher and a good leader. And I think the best leaders are, are great teachers. And, and my dad was that. And as a little kid, I'd go to practice all the time. And I'd be shooting on the side basket while the team was out running their practice, you know, and they chased me off the court and all that. I can remember my dad distinctly on more than one occasion refer to the KISS method of teaching. 
Keep it simple, stupid. That's critical for two reasons today. Number one, it's a complicated world. I mean, uh, this technology is fantastic. We, we love it, but it does complicate some things. There's more people today than there were when I was a kid, a lot more, almost twice as many. And so things are a little more complicated. I think that means leaders and people to find success, you need to simplify things. Keep it simple. Don't try to be doing too many things. Keep it simple. I learned from my dad. The second reason the KISS method of teaching is so important is what we're talking about today. My dad would always talk about that most when his team was struggling, when mm. going through a tough time, when they had adversity. I can distinctly remember him telling me as he's getting his practice plan ready, we got to simplify it. We got to keep it simple. We got too many things going on. We got to simplify it for these guys and get back to the basics, get back to the fundamentals. You know, I talk about the fundamentals of leadership in my book, Make One Play. And the fundamentals, uh, anybody that's participated in sports in anything understands that. You have to master the fundamentals if you want to be a one percenter with leadership no doubt about it i think there's some fundamentals of leadership and so when that crisis hits when adversity hits your business or your healthcare organization or your classroom uh whatever it might be go back to the fundamentals keep it simple stupid and think about what are the fundamentals that make you successful in your world love that all right so let's get into that's that's a great start. And I mean, I know in your book, you talk about the fundamentals, man. It's always back to that. Uh, I love the quote by, uh, in, there's a book called The Four Disciplines of Execution by Chris McChesney and Sean Covey. And Sean Covey's, of the course, the Covey Foundation, which was premised on the, the great book, right? Uh, the Seven Habits. And Sean was a quarterback at uh, BYU. And he had this great quote in the book, uh, winners... When shown data that they are losing, find a way to win. I love that quote. Uh, let's talk about that background on you. Like, where was one of those times where you were up against it, losing? And then you had to find a, a way to come back, get back in it, down but not out. But what? tell me a time that you had that in your life. Oh, man, there's, there's been uh, numerous times. <laughs> right? Uh, where times have been tough and... You know, I, I think I, I learned that best, though, when I was a freshman in college at the University of Toledo. Uh, my coach was Bob Nichols. Now, for mm -hmm. people out there today, they don't know that name. Google Bob Nichols because Coach Nichols is still the winningest coach in the history of the Mid-American Conference in men's basketball. And for mm -hmm. people listening that don't know, Mid-American Conference is Toledo, Bowling Green, Central Michigan, Western Michigan, Miami, Ohio, that bunch. He's still the wingiest coach in the history of the Mid-American Conference. He retired in 1986, passed away about seven or eight years ago. I had the good fortune of playing for him, coaching with him, and, and just at the end of it all, after he retired, to really have some wonderful times with him as a friend. All right. As I was going in my professional career as a leader at Grand Valley, I could meet with Coach Nichols all the time. And he was just a great teacher of not only basketball, but of life lessons. So uh, I go back to my freshman year. I'm at the small town, Pettis, Ohio, first team all state. Our team got to the state finals uh, in my senior year. And, you know, I'm this, that, all, everything. Both of my brothers went to Bowling Green. They were D1 athletes. And here I go to Toledo. And my freshman year, Trent, uh, I was homesick. I was only 45 minutes from home. But I got to tell you, I was, I was homesick. Uh, Schoolwork was a little tougher. Uh, basketball practices were really a lot tougher. Uh, you know, I'm going against all state players every day in practice. And it took everything I had just to keep up with them in practice. And so, I, well, I wasn't, uh, you know, I would have been a great uh, pupil for you as a strength and conditioning coach because <laughs> badly. Uh, I, I was great skill, but I needed to get quicker. I needed to get stronger. I needed to have more endurance. And uh, I just listened to Coach Nichols and what he taught me. And, you know, he told me uh, that the best way to get better as a runner is to run. And so I started running four miles every day in the offseason. But there was a moment in time in my freshman year, like with most college athletes, where you think about, can I make it and mm -hmm. transfer or should I transfer? Every freshman goes through some of those thoughts. And I had mine three weeks into my college career. 
I was struggling, or I'm sorry, three weeks into practice. In those days, we started October 15th. We didn't play a game until after Thanksgiving break. And so we're practicing basketball every day. And man, the practices are hard compared to high school, really hard. And I'm struggling. And I went home to visit with my mom and dad. And I sat down with my mom and dad in our living room. And I'm not ashamed to tell you, I was crying. I didn't think I could make it. I felt the weight of the world on my shoulders. You know, a small town yeah. kid could make it. Sure. All this pressure was on me. And, and mm -hmm. I didn't think I'd ever get to play. And I told dad, I don't know if I'm good enough. I don't know if I can make it through all these practices for four years. I don't know if, you know, I'll ever get a chance to play. I'll never forget what my dad taught me. They sat me down and said to me, he said, Tim, we, your mother and I don't care if you ever get to play, whether you get straight A's or all C's. We don't care. All we want you to do is to do your best. And then he said what was most important. He said, because you see, whether you play a lot or if you never get to play, or if you get straight A's or straight C's, we're going to love you either way. Mm. All I want you to do is just do your very best. And I got to tell you, there was a moment in time in my life when I actually felt weight off my shoulders. Yes. And yes. I went back and I realized, you know, I, I don't need to please anybody else. Please myself. So one of, uh, to wrap up this story, one of my other mentors throughout my life was John Wood, the great coach John Wood from UCLA. And for those of you listening, if you don't know Coach Wooden, Google Coach John Wooden, his pyramid of success, and study that for about 20 minutes this weekend. Because his leadership lessons, although he coached 60, 70, 50, 60 years ago, his leadership lessons are timeless. And Coach Wooden, definition of success is success is a peace of mind, which is a direct result of the self-satisfaction in knowing you did your best to become the best you're capable of becoming. Now, he was a mentor to me from a distance. You can have those as well. I read every book Coach Wooden had ever read. I was a kid growing up in the 60s and 70s. UCLA won 10 national championships. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I played for UCLA. I won that game, right? I was barely going to play a little bit. Coach Wooden, when he was 95 years old, had the opportunity to meet him in person, Trent, in his uh, family room in Encino, California. For me, it was like going to the mountaintop. Shared that definition, and he said, you know, success in his mind was peace of mind, which is direct result, self-satisfaction, knowing you did your best, become the best you're capable of becoming. And he said, only knew, you can know if you did your best. So it, it, I, I grabbed that at that time of adversity in my life and mm. realized that I didn't have to please other people. I didn't do the best I could with what God gave me. Gave me. And if I could do that, I could have that piece of, you know what? It doesn't matter if you win a championship or you make a lot of money or you're the entrepreneur of the year. It doesn't, if you're doing your absolute best and you and your mind know you are, you're going to achieve success. Results will happen. That in mind. I love that. I love that. So, yeah, and you know I'm a big Wooden fan, right? Like, I love it. So. You know, I think it's you're exactly right on, and I and I agree with Kim. I'm going to encourage you to do that. If you have not ever read something from John Wooden, that pyramid of success is a great start. I mean, just to look at that and spend 20 minutes with it this weekend, you will be better for it. I I recently had a discussion with some clients about that pyramid, and I thought it was interesting. There was some you know 45 year old managers that said, "Hey." don't don't these 20 year olds don't they all know this isn't this common sense and i was like oh no 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 like this is not easy it's it's simple but it's not easy right it's not easy you know it, it, it takes hard work um anything does and as i said earlier you know we're, we're humans uh here on our things are going to go wrong yeah we're going to face tough times and i'm going to you know, I'm thankful because he talked all the time with us players about handling adversity. He gave me a lesson on my recruiting visit, Trent. I'm on my visit at Toledo. Yeah, not even signed yet, <laughs> right? I, no, huh? I, and, and, and we're sitting, my dad and Coach Nichols were sitting in his office, and he says to me, he says, now I'm going to offer you a full scholarship. He had my attention then, okay? That's, that's when he got my attention. And he says, we know you're a good shooter. 
We know you're a good ball handler. You're going to have to get quicker and stronger. We'll teach you how to do that. What I don't know about you is how well you will handle adversity. And he went on to tell a story about a player the year before who, for a variety of reasons, they were limited in team travel rosters, and he got left behind on a road trip the team took. And by the time they got home, he packed his bags and left, was gone. He couldn't handle some adversity. And he, I got that lesson on my recruiting visit. Two years later, fast forward, I got through that freshman year that I'm talking about. And it was a tough time. And thankfully, with the help of my parents and the advice I got from my dad and the love they shared to me and listening to Coach Nichols and our coaching staff at Toledo tell me what to do, I got better and better and worked really hard. I came back to my sophomore year. I was ready to go. Uh, I was really playing well. In the third game of the year, I get my first starting assignment my sophomore year. We're playing the University of Detroit at home. Okay. You know who their coach was? See if you can remember who U of D is at that time. He's I'm not still sure. on television today. If you watch the latest Geico commercial, Dick Vitale, okay, what? he beats their coach, and they're ranked, and we're uh, pretty good, and the place is sold out. And it's a local television back then, whatever it was. I get my first starting assignment, and about 10 minutes into the game, I went for a rebound, and so did John Long. John Long played in the NBA for quite a while. He was yes. for U of D, and his hands were about twice as big as mine, and he got the first <laughs> And I jammed my finger in the ball. And I shook my finger and I went up down the court a little bit. And there was a free throw. And I looked down and I looked and my knuckle was gone. I go, eh, that doesn't look real good. And our trainer <laughs> at me, so, is you okay? And I gave him a not so good look. And so the next TV timeout, he looked at me and said, come on, you're going with me. And sure enough, I broke my finger. Okay. Mm. Now, the next day, the team's leaving to go play at Eastern Kentucky. I got to stay back. I'm going to get my finger looked at by the team doc. He's going to fix me up with a removable cast and i got to sit in that dorm room in carter hall you remember carter hall yeah 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 Derek carter east this was friday of exam week nobody was there i there the team has left and i got to spend three hours waiting for the team doctor and sitting by myself in that room all alone and i had a pity party for myself mm. i can remember for about an hour looking out that window on those rec fields out there thinking why me i busted my butt all summer to get ready for this. I got my first starting assignment. And now I broke my finger. And I don't remember how, uh, I don't remember when, but sometime when I'm sitting there, divine intervention, that story came back to me from Coach Nichols of handling adversity. And I said to myself, okay, boy, here you go. Here's some adversity. What are you doing? And I realized I could still run. And I stayed in shape. I ran four miles a day, did jump rope. I could do jump rope. They gave me, it was my left hand. Thank goodness I shot right in. I could still shoot. Okay. I was out two and a half, three weeks. I came back. I had the best run of shooting in my career for the next six weeks. Mm. I learned that because my coach was a great teacher. I've, I've said that before. I'm going to say it again to everybody out there. You want to find success and you want to be a really successful leader, learn to teach. The best leaders in the back, Nick Saban, who you talked about earlier, can really teach his sport. He can. Mm -hmm. He talks about the process and all. He was talking about at, at Toledo in 1990 when he was our head coach. I remember going out the first spring practice, and uh, all right, we hired this Nick Saban guy. Like, Let's see what this guy's got. And within five minutes, I said to myself, "Oh, this dude can really teach his sport." He was working wow. defensive back. And then he got in the offensive line and made him run it again and made him run it again. He was teaching. The best leaders are great teachers. And I do a lot with my clients now in the consulting world about uh, teaching and how to become a good teacher. That's awesome. Let's, uh, let's talk about that one superpower because you've mentioned a couple things along the way. What do you think for Tim Selgo, what was it that separated you from the others? What, what catapulted you to that 1% of, you know, Starter in the MAC, and I, I like to remind people, like you know, how many MAC teams have been in that you know Elite Eight in that you know tournament. By the way, like MAC MAC teams show up and do some damage. And oh, Ohio, I thought was going to go further, but wow. won a nice first round game and got stuck a little bit in that second one. But yeah. you know, pretty tough when you start getting in that Sweet Sixteen and Elite Eight. But there's been plenty of MAC programs along the way. But let's talk about you and. What do you think for you that superpower is it just separated you from the rest? You know, I, I don't know that there was any uh, uh, great things 
but I, I'm gonna I'm gonna mention two things, and they, those both of these are in my book. Make one play. I think they're fundamentals to success. And as I said earlier, I don't know that I had an abundance of talent as a, an athlete or you know as a teacher, coach, leader, but I think there are a couple of things that I had that that separated me. One is strongly believe in maintaining a balance in one's life. In fact, book number three is going to be all about balance. How do you find that work-life balance? And I'm going to I'm going to talk about that a little bit. But the other thing is that I had commitment. I was committed to being the best that I could possibly be. And sometimes, you know, I think people confuse balance and commitment. Well, if you're committed, you work really hard. How do you find balance? Okay. So yeah. let's go back to balance because I also know Trent in one's life, it's almost never in perfect balance. You know, uh, John Savage, who was another great mentor of mine from Toledo, Ohio, the arena now is called Savage Arena. He's a UT alum. He was a giant in the life insurance industry. He's another guy our listeners should Google. John Savage, he passed away in 1994, I believe. All right. He's got a couple books that are still out there. His lessons in those books are still timeless. But John Savage, I had a great fortune coach and associate deed mainly you know he he taught me some lessons uh, about balance he talked about balance you know there are a lot of things that are important in life you know work is important your faith is important your family is important your health is important having a little fun in life is important a lot all these things they're all important and i think everybody strives to all those things well but how do you balance all of those and john savage was a giant in the life insurance industry. So Average and Associates still is a tremendous business in Toledo, Ohio. He took the summers off. He he didn't work in the summer. You know, I mean, we think of teachers that they have the summer off. He took the, he had, I want to say maybe eight or nine kids. They had a large family. And they lived on sort of, and he wanted to spend that time. That's how he found some balance, okay? When I visited with Coach Wood. Coach Wood talked about balance all the time. He preached balance in everything in your life, whether it's diet or uh, working out or work. And so have balance in your life, you know, with your family. And, and it's hard. It's not easy to do that. The effort to do so might even be the most important thing to keep striving to find that work-life balance with your family and your faith and so on. So I think that was one thing that I think I had, Trent, that maybe, uh, again, was God-given because I have a pretty even keel on things. Mm -hmm. I don't get too high and I don't get too low. And, you know, maybe athletics taught me that. Well, I, and that and the great teachers I had, my dad taught me that. My coach, Coach Nichols, taught me that. You know, don't get too high or too low, fellas, and keep an even keel. You know, the world of athletics, you've been in it. Man, you win, you feel great. You don't win, you feel lousy. Yeah. And if you don't keep both in perspective, you know, I used to tell people that, you know, we'd have a big win at Grand Valley or Winter Championship. And, you know, people would say, man, that was great. Isn't it? You, you don't seem all that excited. I said, look, dude, if I get that high or that low after every game, I go to hundreds of games a year. <laughs> all right. I can't do it. So maintaining balance. Coach Wood spoke about emotional control. You want to find success, find a way during adversity. Maintain emotional control. You make mm. best decisions when your emotions are under control. And if you stop and think in your lifetime, when you've made the most mistakes, you probably got all charged up about something good or bad, and you didn't keep your emotions under control. So that's so important, I think, to, uh, to finding a way, especially during adversity. But the second thing I would I would I would share is commitment. You know, I I think I had a commitment to what I was doing. I felt this is what uh, the divine guidance that I was receiving. This, Tim, this is what you're supposed to do. And if you're going to do it, do it to the very best of your ability. Be all in. And I would encourage folks, if they can't feel that way about what they're doing, find, find that thing where they can be all in and make a total commitment to it. And total commitment doesn't necessarily I mean, it's going to go rosy. It's going to be a hard road. You're going to face adversity. But uh, commitment is important, and we can uh, talk uh, 
more on that a little bit later. Yeah, I love that. I love it. And I, and I tell you, I, I felt that. You know, I felt both of those things at Toledo. Like, you know, I, I tell people, like, I tell my kids, you know, when they talk about now coming up and playing athletics, and I said, you know, I wasn't interested in being a college athlete. Like, I was committed, right? Like, I was like, hey, man, yeah. because I wasn't talking about it. I was doing the stuff that I had to do to get there, right? right. I always think if you're interested, you're talking. If you're committed, you're doing, right? And so I think the other thing when I learned at Toledo, you know, part of that balance was, you know, Coach Manny uh, and, and Coach Saban were running the football field house. I was lifting there constantly, getting ready. And, and I had the same thing as you. You know, I had to get bigger, stronger, faster, of course. And I wasn't going up, <laughs> you know, that was for sure. I didn't get Tim Sogo's, you know, height, man. Like, so, man, I had to, I had to work. And I, can, I just spent one off season putting on, you know, 18, 20 pounds of just lean muscle mass. And I was... I was working my tail off and coach Manny was guiding me and a couple had other couple of good mentors, but you know, one of the things I missed out, like I didn't balance some of the skill work. I didn't balance some of the other things in my life. And so what happens is, and I saw this a lot in the pro game too, where you go, Hey, I'm going to work all skill or, or all fitness. And then, and then the skill lags, right? So all of a sudden it's behind or, or the skill goes up and the fitness isn't there. And so there's big gap. And it's like, and so when we talk about, and, and Wooden again, he talks about conditioning. He talks about, you know, uh, physical conditioning. Great. That's very important. Well, when he talks about mental conditioning, crucial, right? Then he talks about spiritual conditioning. Like, whoa, wait a minute. Like, you got to balance the life out here because you got to have it all. So I, I love that. Um, let's talk, let's talk, uh, jump into the values, right? Um, probably the one value belief action that you took you know, when you're down and out, like some, something like you said, you kind of go back to the foundation, you go back to the fundamentals. Like t talk about that a little bit uh, on, on the road to being elite. Yeah. You know, again, I, I keep coming back to uh, uh, KISS method of, of teaching and learning is keep it simple, stupid, and revert to your fundamentals. And, and I think, you know, um, what that means most. I, I don't know that there's a magic answer out there when things go wrong that I reach to and grab it, right? Uh, I, I, I just think that you've got to uh, think about what's important to you in your life. What are your values? You know, I, I'm, I'm a, a Catholic Christian. Uh, that faith is very important to me. It, to me, it's the, it's the foundation of my life with my family, with my work, with everything. And one of the things that I've always done, and again, I, I think I have to thank my dad for the role model that he was in helping me because, man, this has helped me so much, is that every morning he started his morning with a daily devotional. And so well, I don't care if you're a Christian, if you're a Muslim, if you're a Jewish person or not, I think one of the most important things you can do especially when you're going through tough times, is to take the first minutes of the day and just spend them in quiet and think and meditate and pray in whatever way is your tradition or your creed. And with respect to all of them, I think if people will do that, um, I, I think they'll have a better way of handling the crisis of the day or the adversity of the day or the problem, the ongoing problems that they're encountering with their family or their work or their boss or their coworker, right? And I, I think that's important for people. Whether you call it getting centered, you know, and for some people that might mean exercise. Maybe it's, you know, uh, working out first thing. You know, you're, yeah, everybody's got a Peloton today. Everybody wants to have a Peloton. And uh, I don't want to have a Peloton. Not that it's not great. I think mean, it's great for many people. I, of course, I'm too old now to really go with the high intensity stuff. <laughs> I don't know. I walk a lot. I was a jogger, and at about 45, this old uh, basketball played body was done, mm. and I started walking. And I love to walk because I can think, and I can use that time as quiet time. So I would suggest that if, and maybe it's yoga for some people, but whatever it is, start your day. For me, uh, it's, it's with my coffee and juice, okay? I, I, I like to have quiet. And I, 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 again, learned that from my dad, but I also learned it again 
when we had three kids as they were growing up. I'm an early riser. I'm an early to bed, early rise guy. Maybe that's uh, what, what we're getting at here, a value. <laughs> uh, you know, who was it, Ben Franklin? You know, keeps a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. I don't know. But that's the way my body rhythm goes. And I go to bed early and I get up early. My wife's just the opposite. My wife, Terry, she, now. I always tell people, well, we miss each other for four hours every day. Hmm. Go to bed two hours before her. She gets up two hours after me. And that balance is what made our marriage work. Yeah. I get up early and for me it's it's having some coffee and just having some quiet time. For me, I read scripture, I spend a little time in prayer. Uh I might watch uh something online as you know, as uh online uh virtual podcasts, so on. Everything has grown in the last 10 years. You know, I, I'm a Catholic, I can watch daily mass in the morning. Mm -hmm. I start my day. Whatever it is for you, find that to get you centered before you start your day, every day, and then develop that as a habit. I don't know if that's one of Covey's seven habits or not, but I think that's critical to finding balance in your life. And I think you'll find success and you'll be a better leader and you'll be a better worker uh, if you do that. Start your day with, and, and I advise, 10 minutes of quiet. And this wor the world's a noisy place, Trent. It's oh. noisy, man. Yeah. And if we don't make an effort to find quiet and let your whole mind, body, and soul start to uh, think and learn. And uh, so I recommend 10 minutes. I do much more than that now. And in fact, I did more than that throughout the time uh, in my career. It would be about 45 minutes to an hour of no noise. Because when the kids are growing up, for those of you with children, I'm talking about, as they're getting ready for school, there's nothing but noise and chaos. And I used to tell my uh, coworkers, I've been through World War III and I haven't gotten to work yet, but <laughs> an hour before they got going. So I would, to me, that's a, that's a go-to for me, if you will call that value really a go-to. Love it. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's turn it over to Q and A. I want to get going here, but before we do that, first of all, Tim, thank you so much for, for 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 joining us. I know our listeners see the value in this. I love going back to the fundamentals. You know, learning from you again. Uh, you know, keep it simple, right? Get back to your fundamentals. Uh, ground yourself every morning with some prayer, some quiet time, some gratitude. Like, get in that. Start your day right. Get that. Get that balance back in, because it is. Even though. Uh, you know, and, and, and we know that certainly from the strength side, right? How hard we work, the value of rest and nutrition. So now you can come back and give it your best effort again becomes so important. Like, hey, I don't, I don't, I don't ever lay the body down. Guess what? Eventually the pra the the practice suffers, the gameplay suffers, the fatigue sets in. You know, I went through that. I did too much, did the overload and and did the uh, stress fractures in the shins, you know, like I had, uh, you know, doing too much and not balanced, not smart, right? Working hard, not working very smart. So I love that. So great stuff today. Um, so real quick again, tell us where we can find you. Okay. I can, uh, on Twitter, it's at Tim Selgo. Uh, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram. My, my blog is timselgo.tumblr.com. And uh, I'm consulting now with athletic staffing consultants. So you can go to our website. It's athleticstaffingandconsultants.com. And, uh, you know, you can read a little bit more about me there and find out the work that I do now and, and so on. Uh, but uh, my books are both on Amazon. Trent, everybody goes to Amazon today. Yep, that's yeah. right. Bezos I ordered it on Amazon. I did. Yeah. And uh, so that is my book I got right here, Make One Play. So is the next book make one more play or is it going to be more about balance? <laughs> no, the next one's going to be about balance. That's uh, stay tuned on that. Stay tuned. Okay. Got it. All right. Um, awesome. Oh, Tim, that's great. That's awesome. That's awesome. So if you had one thing to finish with, uh, something you might add that we didn't cover that you think may be just a crucial fundamental for, for the folks that are looking yeah. to take one step ahead, that, you know, sure. one of those things that getting back, to what's most important. And one of the things we, we maybe haven't talked about that, I know you've got a lot of coverage. There's a lot of real estate in your books. So yeah. maybe one key well, thing that you might want to mention. And, I, and I'll come back. I mentioned it briefly earlier is commitment. You know, commitment is different than just working hard. A lot of people work 60, 80 hours a week and they're not getting anywhere uh, because they're not committed. 
not committed to the right things, let's say. Okay. Uh, so what does commitment mean? What does it truly mean? Well, I'm going to go back to my coach. And two things I learned from him, two, two things Coach Nichols harped on all the time with us players. You know, to the point where in the locker room, the guys would roll their eyes again. And, you know, uh, we, 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 we did, we'd have a little fun with that. But, but we all, as we became adults, accepted this as, yeah, Coach Nichols was right. One of those is to, to make a commitment, to be committed to something, to be your absolute best. You have to do the little things well. You know, I, mm. I listened to your show with uh, Scott Spezio, and he talked about that with Joe Madden, the great baseball manager with the uh, Cubs and the uh, Tampa Bay team. Um, you know, the great teachers, the great leaders, the great coaches talk about that all the time. And there's a reason they talk about it, Trent, because it's true. If you want to be successful, if you want to be a one percenter, you've got to do the little things well. You must do the little things well. And Coach Nichols harped on that all the time in basketball. You know, it would be the fundamentals. And I can remember him on more than one occasion when we stopped a drill and we're going to the next drill, he'd blow the whistle. And he'd say, give him a good pass. And he was pointing at the manager. The manager was by the ball rack. And he goes, I don't care if you're throwing a pass to the manager. Give him a good pass with some zip and hit him chest high. That's a little thing. And our teams were great passing teams. In basketball, the best teams are the best offensive teams are great passing teams. Watch Gonzaga; they're really good passing team. Right? Mm. And and he harped on the little things. You're going to set a screen, set it the right way. You're going to get. Uh, you want to play good defense. You got to get in the stands. And you get the little things. That's true in life. That's mm. true. Any walk of life. Do the little things. Well. The second thing that he harped on, and again, my book, Make One Play, is based on this. Coach Nichols had a saying that I never heard another coach before or since use this saying, and it makes so much sense. He used to tell us all the time, you never know what one play will lead to, fellas. You never know what one play will lead to. Oftentimes, we'd be watching film, and he'd point out a little, something somebody did a little thing and did it well, and it led to a score that we needed it at that time, or mm -hmm. Gave us possession and stopped the other team because somebody dove for a loose ball. He'd point those out all the time. So what message did that give us? It gave us, yeah, the little things are important. So in your work, think about what those little things are. And are you doing them well? We had a great president at Grand Valley State University, Don Lovage. He built the school. He was president for 33 years. There's legendary stories about Don Lovers walking around campus, stopping, picking up a, a piece of paper or candy wrapper that was on the lawn. It's a little thing, but it matters. The beauty of the place matters in higher education. Mm -hmm. That screen matters in basketball. Saying hello to somebody in the hallway, taking some time for someone, it matters. You never know what one play will lead to. And in the walk of life, you never know what one great effort will lead to. You never know what it will lead to. I have a great story about that in my book. And I'm going to encourage to tease people. Uh, to yeah, yeah, that's good. Read my story about Chris Penzine, our men's tennis player at Grand Valley. The Laker Nation, we're the Lakers at Grand Valley. The Laker Nation, most 99% of them don't even know Chris Penzine. He's my favorite Laker of all time. Wow. Story. He demonstrated commitment when nobody else cared and nobody else was paying attention. And you do the little things well when nobody's paying attention and nobody cares. And those, so that's, a, I guess, one other thing that I would study and encourage them to uh, read that story because uh, I told this story, some may have heard it before, but uh, uh, we don't have enough time today for me to tell that story, but it's a great one. But yeah, we're gonna have to save that. We're gonna have to save that for next time, man. That's good. Maybe, maybe next time. But commitment is so do the little things well, and you never know what one play. You never know, Trent, what one word of encouragement or taking two minutes to spend struggling and give them a smile, give them some advice and some help, and just let them know you're there. You never know what that will lead to. Mm. You want to be a one percenter? Those are the things, you, in my opinion, you have to do. 
I love that. And I, I love the, the vision of that, really, when you talk about the fundamentals of doing the little things. And we talk about, we talked about Wooden's Pyramid. You know, if you want to build on something, you, you've got to get the foundation right. And, and a lot of people yeah. come in my work and talk about, boy, I'd really like that, that manager job. I'd really like to be on this side of the, of the ladder. But, hey, where you're at in the ladder right now, you're not doing it well. Like, and the only thing they can judge you on is how you're doing those things before they give you more responsibility, right? And so I think that's a big challenge for folks. And we know from homes, right, when we talk about a foundation, like, hey, you pour a bad foundation, it's got cracks, it's got leaks in it, we can't go up too high <laughs> because this thing's gonna fall down if we, if we don't have a good foundation. We're gonna have issues. So I love that, I love that visual uh, of how important those things are. So uh, one thing before we go, uh, I'm going to get your quote of the day. So you can think about that for a second. For everybody else, please follow our YouTube live show, Winners Find a Way. We have many more videos on the Leadershipity channel. Uh, we try to educate people. Um, and uh, we are on Instagram, Twitter at Leadershipity, Trent M. Clark. My, my handles can be found on both LinkedIn uh, and Facebook and all those things, either at Trent M. Clark or Leadershipity. So we are at leadershipity.com. And if you have listened, yeah, I want you to rate the uh, show five stars. Please watch for our upcoming ebook, The Pyramid of Leadershipity. And we're going to talk about all those itties and how you build that foundation in the pyramid. So that's uh, we're excited about that project we're working on right now. Let's Let's go back to the one quote. What's the one quote when you're talking about getting you on and, and, and moving you along? And you can always, this quote will take you right back to getting back on that solid foundation, getting back on your line to success. Like what, what grounds you and get that? Do you have a go-to? Well, I, I'm going to give you two. I'll give them real quick. Okay. They're both definitions. I wouldn't say they're quotes, but they're, and both of these can be found on Coach John Wood's period of success. So uh, I encourage everybody, Google, study that this weekend. Okay? Love it. One of them is the definition of competitive greatness. You know, my, my first book, Anchor Up, Competitive Greatness, The Grand Valley Way, right? Because that was one of the things we wanted to challenge our student athletes. We wanted to challenge them to competitive greatness, and we defined it the way Coach Wooden defined it. And his definition was competitive greatness is coming through with your best effort is most needed. Now, when we watch March Madness, we're going to see a lot of that. You're going to see a lot of great plays by great players when their team needs it the most. That doesn't yes. happen by turning on a switch. That yeah. happens because that kid has spent hours in the weight room. He spent hours running to get better. He spent hours shooting baskets to get better. He's worked like crazy with his team on, on their patterns and, and so on. All right. So the way to come through with your best effort, best performance when it's most needed, you've got to do it every day. Mm. That's one definition. Hold on. I want to jump in there right now because there's a couple of really nice examples I like of that. Right. We just watched Tom Brady in the Super Bowl yes. not too long ago. Yeah. Right. Being your best in the tennis world. We've talked about a couple of tennis players. You know, I was in that world for a while. We're hoping to have Todd Martin on pretty uh, top four player in the world. And uh, and that, you know, Roger Federer for me was one of those great examples of like, hey, here it is. The 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 big championship of of a uh, one of the big majors. And here he is playing out of his mind. And you're like, most people get tight. Oh, no. Not Roger Federer, he's prepared. And I just thought Jordan, you know, another guy yeah. that when it's needed, right? Yeah. So uh, there's some just great examples of this. And I think your example is spot on because you can see this tonight, right? Tonight, March Madness is going on. And you can see this tonight because you're going to go, hey, here's the two players to watch. And the commentator is going to all talk about this, this player on this team and this player on that team. And now their best is needed in the Sweet 16. And how do they show up? The preparation of meeting that moment will be absolutely critical. So I love that. Okay, let's go to number two. All right. The second uh, uh, one, again, I'm going to go back to something I referred to earlier. Coach Wood's definition of success. This is the one I always revert to, Trent. Success is peace of mind, which is a direct result of self-satisfaction, knowing you did your best, to become the best you're capable of becoming. All right. You know, uh, every day, you know, you, you, you're struggling with something. You're trying to accomplish something and, or you're trying to solve a problem that takes days or months to solve. And, 
and you're trying to get there. You've got a project. You, you're asked, they're asking you to do this at work and challenging and you feel appeal all the time. I always in those times when I feel the most tired, perhaps, when I feel the most frustrated, when I feel the most like I'm not sure I can do this, I go back to what's success? It's a peace of mind, a direct result, self-satisfaction, knowing I did my best, become the best capable of becoming. My freshman year of college is one example. Yes. It happens throughout my life, whether I'm as a parent, as a leader, as a friend, you know, as a consultant, as a writer, uh, you, you just I just keep going that, dude, just do the best you can. No, mm. that's more out of you than if you just do your absolute best. That's and right. When I finished my career as an athletics director, I finished my career as a player. Uh, okay, one last story, real quick. I end my career at Toledo as a player. We lose against Florida State in the NCAA tournament. And if we'd won, we'd played Kentucky. And they're number one in the country. And I wanted to play Kentucky so bad. About 30 to 35 minutes we had the lead when it slipped away and we got beat. We got beat, we got done, and it was crushing. That was my senior year. That was it. Uh, you know, I was a good college player. I was never going to be a pro. And I can remember being in the shower and it all hit me all of a sudden. Uh, that's it. And so all those years that I put together and worked to get to here, it's done. My career is over. And I cried. I'm telling you, I cried like a baby for five minutes under that shower. Now, all of a sudden, again, whatever it is, divine intervention, whatever, I had that peace of mind. Because mm. somehow, some way, I said to myself, dude, you got to be as good as you were ever going to get. You're not yeah. in the pros. And you know what? It's okay. From that moment on, I spent some time with my parents and my brothers after the game. I felt better. And it was time to get on with the rest of my life. Mm. And to move forward. And at some point in time, you always got to tell yourself, do the best you can. And if that's not good enough, move on. Go to the next thing. So I, mean, I love that transition because that's a, that's a big part of it. life is going to be about transitions and taking those skills that you learned before and transitioning that to the next thing is so crucial. So my quote, by the way, and this is by total happenstance, is that I pulled out a John Wooden today and I didn't know we were going to talk about John Wooden so much. But uh, John Wooden, and I love this, that he told you like, hey, because your quote there, you'll know. You'll know if it's your best. You'll know if you did your best. So you have a, a, a check in that of how you did every time. You just need a mirror, right? And you'll know like, hey, I got to look at me and say, hey, did I do it? Did I do my best in this? But Coach Wooden, uh, what we have is our gift from God. But what we are is our gift to him. And I thought this, I thought of you for this, Tim, because when I saw that quote, I thought, man, you know, Tim's been blessed. He's, he's got some gifts. You mentioned those things and, and you've maximized, I think, a lot of those gifts. And uh, But I, I really honor the fact that you've been a great gift to me as a mentor to a lot of people. Uh, and, you know, every time and what probably I love most about you, because now we live pretty close, you know, 31 years later, we live pretty close to each other now. <laughs> and, our, and our paths cross with a lot of uh, similar people in our lives that may know both of us. And I, I am so impressed that every time I mention your name, a smile comes to the person's face and they light up with, with encouragement, admiration, uh, joy when they hear your name. And I, I think that just says a lot about a person, Tim. And, and I'm just thankful, man. I, and so that quote to me, I think you've, you've shown and you've used your gifts and I, and I think you know, God's going to recognize that as well. So for everybody today, so thank you. Thank you so much, Tim, for being on. Um, thanks for listening in today. We will see you on the next episode of Winners Find a Way. We're going to take it over to Q&A here in just a minute, but wrap the show. And with that, thank you for everyone joining us. Q&A, real quickly. Uh, super excited about uh, a couple questions for you, man. Good. First of all, Good. is what what's uh, what's one of those things... Tim, that you learned from from the various organizations that you were in on that athlete that all of a sudden you extracted and said, hey, I've really got to be clear to get this right with the organizations now that I'm running. Uh, 
you know, I, I, again, I don't know if I can put in any one thing, but I can, I can, I can confident I can share with you my approach. Um, you know, I've always felt that one of the things that's important, if you want to find success, look at what others are doing, doing well, and, and follow that. And so when I entered my professional career, I looked at ADs, coaches and ADs that were successful, and I felt did it the right way, and I emulated that. However, along the way, I also saw some that I did not want to emulate. I, yeah. I saw some that I thought were negative. They weren't, uh, uh, you know, they didn't have the character that I would respect. And uh, so, you know, as I got to the point where at the age of 38, I was given the responsibility of being a leader of an athletics department, uh, I felt I was ready to go. I felt I was ready to step right through the door and be successful because it comes back to that lifelong learning. I just kept yes. along the way and I just kept watching and kept wanting to get better. You know, there's a great article out there. People can find it. Sports Illustrated wrote it, I want to say two years ago, maybe. Uh, Google, you can find uh, an article on Nick Saban and Bill Belichick. They're a great, they have a great relationship. Yes. And it goes way back to when Nick was coaching with Belichick's dad at the, at the Naval Academy. Nick yes. Was assistant football coach. There. But the lesson in that article, now these are the two most successful football coaches, not only in our lifetime, but maybe forever, right? One at the NFL level, Belichick, and one at the college level, Saban. And they're constantly trying to get better. They yeah. get together, and they're picking each other's brains, and they're working on things. What are you doing? And they're always getting better. We hired Nick Saban in 1990 at Toledo to be our head football coach. He was a highly successful assistant. And he comes in on the associate AD, and, you know, it's uh, – Early January, recruiting's in full force in those days. That was a big time recruiting. We had to get going. And I had, my job was to help Nick get up to speed on all the particulars and onboarding him to Toledo, right? All the little things to get ready to go. Here's when your prior workout times are. Here's where this and that. And so in his first week, I went over to his hotel room. He was, uh, we put him up in a hotel and he said, we sat in his hotel room and we went over for two hours, all the little things of what he, in the middle of that, he got a phone call back in the days when you got phone calls on <laughs> phones. And it was another coach somewhere. Nick grew up in West Virginia. And he, he it was, I want to say this from West Virginia or somewhere. And he said, I'm coming home. Terry and I, his wife, Terry, and he were coming home that summer. He said, let's get together and talk ball. And I remember, it's like the dude, he, he, he's already talking about, he wants to talk football on his vacation. Okay? Yeah. So I, I don't know if that's answers to everybody in their question, but you, you got to continually be in a learning mode. All mm. try to get better. For me now that I'm a consultant, I I look back on my early that I wrote in strategic and consulting five years ago, ah, they weren't that good. I, I've gotten better, and uh, I try to do the same with my speaking engagements. I try to do the same in my books. I, you know, it's a whole different world from being an athletics director. And while maybe I'm, I'm decent at writing, uh, I've had to get better at it. And uh, just keep that lifelong learning in the forefront. And man, you know, all of a sudden you look back and you realize what you accomplished, and you feel pretty good about things. I love that. And as we talk about Coach Saban, you know, he's another Mac player, by the way. He played at Kent State. So I just want to, you know, shout out to the Mid-American Conference, right? Um, yeah, and likely to be the maybe the winningest college coach. I mean, the national championships already record is incredible. So let's, uh, let's pivot to, I get this question a lot on our show. Your advice on learning from mistakes, errors, as well as learning from successes. Like, what's your, what's your bend on that? Uh, the first step is to admit you made a mistake. Yeah. And, you know, we don't see much of that these days, it seems like. Everybody wants to uh, cover for themselves. And everybody's worried about how it will look on social media or, you know, television and so on. 
And so the first thing is to admit you made a mistake. And, you know, I, I, like I said earlier, I, I've made a bunch of them. I can remember, uh, if not the specifics, uh, being with my staff at Man Valley. And, um, uh, you know, I, I made a mistake in hiring one, one time. Uh, and it was a mistake of uh, maybe not being as prepared as I should be. Uh, maybe not knowing uh, our situation at Grand Valley as well as I should have. And uh, I think in, in, in another part, it was a mistake of that energy that's needed in the hiring process. You know, one of the fundamentals I talk about in my book, uh, Trent, is uh, people make you successful. Mm -hmm. I don't care what it is. I don't care what widget you're selling or what you're trying to, people make you successful. People make those widgets, okay? Somebody's selling those widgets. Somebody has to lead the company, manage things, and, and, and it's people that do that. Whether it's athletics or business or healthcare or education or no doubt. Uh, religion, it doesn't matter. People will make you successful. And I made the mistake one time that, you know what, I didn't, Focus totally on that, that that search process that we were in, and I thought it was it perhaps wasn't uh, uh, a lead position in our department, but man, did it turn out to be a mistake. And I remember at the end of the year, as time went, as the problems mounted, I don't want to say halfway through this year, I thought to myself, "Dude, you you made a mistake. You did a lousy job on that." <laughs> You know, it was up to me to correct it. I was the leader. I made a mistake. And I shared that with my boss and I shared it with the rest of my staff. And I immediately noticed amongst my staff when they knew that I knew I had made a mistake, uh, how much uh, better our relationship was. That they knew I was going to correct myself and get that take care of. And we did. And uh, for 24 years now, Grand Valley's been fortunate because I made that mistake. And I got somebody so much better in that spot. <laughs> so, you know, uh, the, the first step is admitting it. <clears throat> then commit. And I, I, you know, let's face it, we're talking about firing somebody. And a lot of people, you know, that's an uncomfortable discussion. Yeah. Understandably so. If you care about people like you and I care about people, it's not easy. Not fun. You know, I, I've one of the things that I've done is I've always when I've when I've come to that point of we got a problem here with someone. And I believe I was a leader that uh, uh, gave people perhaps one year more than most would have given them. I I, I wanted to give them every effort, every chance to make it better. And at the conclusion of that, uh, in my mind, I, if I knew the organization was suffering because of that individual or because of a mistake I was making, I had to correct the mistake. And it comes back to, you know, uh, being a part of a team and putting the team first, and putting the organization first, and as uncomfortable as it might have been for me and as uh, uh, problematic as it was, I had to do what was best for the organization. That's leadership. And sometimes the price of leadership is to take a few punches now and then. Mm -hmm. So we had to do that. And, and so I think for me, um, it, it kind of came down to that and coming back to do the best you can. You know, mm -hmm. you make mistakes. It's going to happen. You're going to have failure. My goodness. Uh, everybody has. Nobody goes through life without any failures. And, uh, but you've got to admit that. Yeah, I love it. I love it. The admission of it. I, I know that, uh, in our work, it's been so important to go back and review the tapes and like, yeah. Hey, we, we made errors like that. Not a big deal. Like let's go back and look at what went well and what didn't. Right. And I think that's really important for organizations to take that time and do that audit. Well, that that's, we call that humbling ourselves. That's humility. You, you know, 
in this world today, especially what we see in the public positions, whether it's sports, politics, uh, you know, with uh, television and multimedia platforms, anybody can become a star, right? Anybody can become a rock star. You know, you get the right, all of a sudden you get 80 zillion followers and you're a rock star. Mm-hmm. Hold on, check yourself. I, I, w- one way I would do that was I just keep telling myself, you know, I get a little success and you, know, you get a little bit of a big hit. They do. You're from Pennsylvania, Ohio, man. <laughs> you go to Pennsylvania, Ohio, they, they're going to remember you as the young kid that was shooting baskets all the time. But, yeah. but we, you've got to humble yourself. There's a humility that goes with all these things we're talking about, Trent. And then the other word that comes to mind, it's we don't talk about this very much at all when we talk about leadership, but it's one of the most underrated things in leadership, in my opinion. And I used to look for it and nobody really talks about it, but it's maturity. Mm. I don't. Another good itty, by the way. I like it. Humility and maturity. Keep, keep up with these itties. You're doing great, Tim. <laughs> when, when, when you want, you're dealing with coaches. Yeah. Just are in a highly competitive world you know what it's like you've been in the big leagues you know it's highly competitive you're with highly competitive people that's one reason to keep emotional control but you want coaches that have a maturity about it mm. I'm an example and 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 there's numerous examples out there in coaching tony bennett at the university of virginia men's basketball coach they won a national championship two years ago Yes, the last national championship. The year before that, they were most famous for being the only number one seed to ever lose to a number 16 seed. University of Maryland, Baltimore County beat them. They, they were first round knockout. And he handled that with maturity. His press conference with his team, and then they went to work. And then they went to work, and the next year, they were national champions. I mean, mm. Google that. Find the YouTubes. Find the story of that and watch that. If you want to see an example of the kind of leader that I like, I like leaders like that, that have that maturity and that humility. You know, number one seed, this got beat by University of Maryland, Baltimore, and he congratulated them. They outplayed us. They did a better job. They deserved to win. And both coaches that would complain about the officials, you know, yep. The team went to right, you know, COVID. Well, you know, we had a, a guy out with COVID two weeks ago, and, you know, it just threw our whole team off, right? We've seen yeah. that. You see him in politics all the time, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, that's, that, to me, that's a key in life. And be, you want to be a one percenter? You, you need to possess some maturity. Yeah, for me, I, uh, I am not a Clemson fan, but I am a Dabo Swinney fan. Right. Because I think he has that humility and maturity as a leader that 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 you just described. And I think that uh, leaders need to understand that there is a challenge because you are the authority. And if you're going to be an authority, you probably almost a requirement would be that humility, that maturity and that integrity. Those three things without that. You know, it's tough to, you You know, a lot of people can get authority by title for a short time, yeah. <laughs> right? But like to stay in that actually and act inside that and be a long term and understand when that authority, and this is how you utilize that authority. I think a lot of people think I'm using my authority in a forceful manner, like this is very authoritative, but I think being the authority is humbling yourself saying, Hey, I erred as the coach and I didn't prepare us the right way, right? Like I should have done a better job. And I think that's also taking your position as the authority and taking ownership, right? So love that, man. Love that. Hey, we got to wrap it up. We are on time. So, uh, man, I I appreciate this extra time, Tim. I know you're a busy guy. I'm pulling you off the typewriter as you're writing some more page. Well, do even people use a typewriter anymore? But, um, uh, I know you're busy uh, with this third book, super exciting. And hopefully we're going to see you along the road here in your speaking engagements and everything else. People know now they can find you. You're looking for Tim Selgo to speak or you want to pick up one of his books at Amazon. Like, hey, you've heard it today. You will get 
high quality information on how to be elite, how to get better, how to make one play. I love it, man. So thank you so much, Tim. Thank you for joining us for another Winners Find a Way show. I am your host, Trent Clark. If you love this episode, share this episode with your friends and follow us on whatever podcasting medium you're listening to. If you want more content from us, join us at leadershipity.com or the Leadershipity YouTube channel. You can find us on all the social media networks at either Trent M. Clark or Leadershipity for our award-winning workshop win with great teams you can find that page on linkedin as well as our corporate page leadershipity if you want to win more it starts with you today say it with me now i have what it takes